I, I have shown or I have put together a number of things for the show, and I thought today I would um, talk about just a couple of them, and I'm happy to talk um, more about any of the others if people would like to. I think you've all seen the list of the different different material that I chose for the exhibition. I'm happy to speak to anything. But the ones that I, I thought I would highlight today are two collections, uh, two vitrines um, in the show, one of which um, has um, letters from Claude Lanzmann uh, to Simone de Beauvoir. Um, and the other is um, a, a selection of love poems and letters from Guy Debord uh, to his first wife, uh, Michelle Bernstein, and the reason I thought they went well together is they make me, uh, uh, they're, they're, both of these women, Michelle Bernstein and Simone de Beauvoir, are incredible towering intellects um, and people of great, um, great stature, and in Michelle's case, certainly I know from having met her personally, someone of tremendous wit and, and, and a great sense of humor along with that. Um, but they tend to be um, people who, uh, operate in the shadow of their more famous um, husbands or lovers, in the case of Simone de Beauvoir, <clears throat> um, uh, who was, of course, um, uh, the lifetime partner of um, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, the sort of pope of existentialism in France, I suppose you could say. So um, the reason I thought that it would be nice to include them in the show is to sort of give a different perspective on some people who are really quite well known. And I realized that for many of you, Guy Debord um, may not fall into that category, but I'll, I'll talk briefly about, about Debord as well when I get to, uh, get to her. But first, just um, the letters from uh, Claude Lanzmann. Um, there are uh, maybe 112 letters, I think, that were written uh, to uh, Simone de Beauvoir between 1952 and 1959 which was the period in which they were having a, um, a serious uh, relationship um, that um, actually involved the two of them living together, um, which is something that Simone de Beauvoir did not ever do with another man, including Sartre. Um, so um, the letters are letters that are filled with really um, amazing effect, terms of affection, she calls him, uh, she, uh, Simone uh, de Beauvoir calls uh, Claude Lanzmann my little Sherpa, and, um, and he's her guide to um, all sorts of things, uh, physical pleasures as well as um, the other kind. And um, <clears throat> as well as intellectual pleasures. And um, uh, the letters are just full of all, I love you so much, I'm crazy about you, I want to be, you know, I, I, I want to be married, which is something that you never imagine uh, Simone de Beauvoir saying to anyone, because she's, of course, um, really is a very famous philosopher in her own right, a very famous feminist. Her, her, um, her writings, The Second Sex, is particularly uh, well known, but her writing in general, she wrote many, many books. Um, uh, that have had a tremendous influence on the development of uh, feminism in France and, and well beyond there. So um, she is someone who uh, um, uh, nevertheless, in spite of all that, tends to be someone that many people think of as, you know, as uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's wife. Uh, and in fact, she they were never married and she never lived with uh, with Sartre, she refused to do that. Um, they did swear a lifelong pact that they would always be um, there for each other and that they were their primary um, lifelong companions, but um, they had a very open relationship. And so the, the relationship she had with Claude Lanzmann is one of many that she had. She had relationships both with women and men. Um, Claude Lanzmann was the last man that she had a serious relationship with. Um, and when they parted in 1959, she had just met Sylvie Le Bon, who became her really great love um, at, toward the end of her life. Um, um, so the letters are um, 
interesting in a lot of different ways. And the reasons that I, I find them interesting is because they provide a very different perspective than Sartre does on the trips that they took. The letters are from 1952 to 1959. It's a period when uh, Sartre is kind of appointed himself the ambassador or the anti-ambassador of the Western world and is going around to places like the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, um, all over the place to sort of represent um, a, a dissenting point of view on what the West is about. And um, we know that story very well from Sartre's perspective, but uh, de Beauvoir's letters give a different perspective on that. So um, the letters are incredibly difficult to read. Um, uh, Alice Kaplan, who teaches uh, French here, um, distinguished um, endowed uh, chair professor in the French department, um, uh, admits that even she has a, a difficult time reading um, the handwriting of the letters. But um, uh, the Beauvoir's letters are, um, um, are uh, have become famous for reasons other than the one that I just mentioned, which is they give a different perspective on, on, on the intellectual content of, of, of the time and the political content. Um, in that um, it was Claude Lanzmann himself who decided to sell the letters to Yale. I was contacted directly um, by uh, a uh, auction house that offered the letters to us um, on behalf of Claude Lanzmann. And the reason he did that was because he was upset that he felt um, that he was being written out of the Beauvoir's story. Um, uh, and that had to do with a lot of uh, family politics and relationships. But essentially, he felt that if he didn't sell the letters to someplace and place them outside of France, um, that they would never get published. They would never see the light of day because the family was. And, and so he gave all sorts of uh, after we agreed to buy the letters and the, the deal was basically done, he gave a lot of press interviews where he announced this fact proudly and said that, you know, in America, they don't really care about copyright and things like that. So, um, so that's why I did it, so that they would be published in spite of the reservations. And I had to kind of do a little damage control and say, well, actually, we do care about things like copyright here um, and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but in the process of, of sort of uh, promoting the letters, Lanzmann made a, made a real emphasis on the fact, the depth of, the, of Simone de Beauvoir's love for him. And so um, in all sorts of newspapers, um, from, you know, from Liberation and Le Monde in France to uh, Guardian in England to, yeah, I think I saw one in the Hindustan Times, um, uh, 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 all of these letter, all of these uh, uh, headlines were saying, you know, love letters from uh, from uh, Simone de Beauvoir have been uh, uh, purchased by uh, Vaniki Library at Yale, and it made quite a quite a big stir. So it was kind of a, a funny story there. And the the interesting part about it is that you know, Lanzmann himself really initially didn't want the letters to be published. He knew that Simone de Beauvoir would not want them published. Um, because she talks about a lot of uh, people in there who um, she knew and didn't want that information as necessarily being shared. But Lanzmann eventually felt like he had to, um, he felt like he was being pushed out and he just had to get these letters published. So um, the stories in the American press in particular tended to focus on the fact that it was, you know, yeah. Claude Lanzmann's body that was the, the great attraction, and there was a lot written about that. The French papers were a bit more nuanced, but the thing that, that I would um, encourage people to keep in mind as they look at the letters is the, the extent to which Lanzmann, and who was himself an important filmmaker, uh, some of you may know him from from uh, the um, series, uh, the, the long uh, film series, um, which his name is Showa, um, about the um, Holocaust in Poland that he produced in the 80s um, and was something that Beauvoir uh, continued to help him with there. Um, that um, their relationship was really as much about intellectual exchange as anything. And um, the, the fact that they, they, they also fell deeply in love um, on, on, a, on a sexual level is certainly important and interesting, but um, I don't want it to be the whole story that people get out of looking, looking at those materials and, and, and those letters. Um, 
And the reason for that is, again, that it tends to overshadow, I think, the, the intellectual side of, uh, of Simone de Beauvoir as a philosopher and a feminist in her own right. Um, and the same really goes much more, I think, for um, Michelle Bernstein, um, who, um, Mike, if you could just maybe put up the, the lovely portrait that we have of Michelle at this point, it'll give somebody, people something else other than me. I just love this portrait. It was done by Ivan Chislov in the early 1960s, uh, a beautiful portrait of uh, Michelle Bernstein down in the letter style. It's called the Metagraphic Portrait of Michelle Bernstein. Uh, Michelle Bernstein was the first wife of Guy de Boer, who is famous in a lot of circles, um, maybe um, uh, not to you, but in a lot of circles because he was the really the main voice and the, and the founder of the Situationist International, which was a, a movement that was um, really in the beginning of artistic inspiration, but also had a strong political um, agenda behind it. Um, it's a movement that will be featured in the exhibition I'm doing in the fall, which uh, Mike mentioned, which is called Art in Protest. Um, and it's really about the intersection between art and, um, uh, and um, movements for liberation and, and uh, subversive movements of various kinds in both America and Europe, and mainly in the 20th century, second half of the 20th century. So as the situation has played a hugely important role in that, and Guy de Boer is sort of the towering figure who um, um, has established himself as the great genius of that movement. And there's no doubt about his genius. Um, certainly he was one. But um, Michelle Bernstein uh, was a figure behind the scenes there who um, rarely comes out as such. And part of the reason for that is that she herself is incredibly self-demeaning about her own importance. Um, she, um, she, uh, she um, the first time I met her, I remember, um, we talked for, for several hours and she said, you know, why are you asking me all these questions about myself? Why aren't you asking me about Guy? And I had to say, well, because I'm interested in you, Michelle. I think you're, you're fascinating. She wrote several novels about the, the situationists in the early years. But more than that, she was really someone behind the scenes from the very beginning who shaped the, uh, the ideas of the situationists in power, powerful ways. Um, the, the letters that I put on view and the, and the poems are uh, sort of a testament to that. And as with Claude Lanzmann, Michelle decided she wanted those letters to come to Beinecke because in part because she felt like her role in the situationist movement was being, uh, and her, particularly her relationship to Guy de Boer was being portrayed in a light that did not do her any, any favors. In particular, people were saying, and people continue to say that she was just a cash cow um, for Guy de Boer, and that as soon as he found other sources of money, he left her and all this, which is just really ridiculous. I mean, uh, uh, they both lived in, in rather, you know, uh, extreme circumstances in terms of poverty um, in the early 1950s when they were together and when these letters were written. Um, and she had to do things like write horoscopes in for newspapers in order to make money to keep them going. So she wasn't a cash cow, um, but she also was somebody who had a tremendous um, intellectual um, uh, um, presence of her own. And you can see that in a letter that I put out from B. De Boer to her in the early 60s when they're apart for a certain amount of time for some reason. And Guy de Boer just um, openly admits to her that he, um, he descends into a, a real kind of a physical depression um, in her absence. Um, so it looks like I maybe should be wrapping up, but 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 what he says is, you know, I I, I you know I just I, I'm drinking, I can't think, I'm not, you know, I just I really when you wrote me that letter that I just got, it made so much difference to me, and it's an incredible letter because um, because Guy de Boer is is really somebody who in his letters, uh, his correspondence with uh, with many many people has has been published in eight volumes by. Um, uh, in, in France, in a, in a huge series, um, his letters are uh, wonderful, but they're also extremely, extremely guarded. He's always um, putting forward 
forward a very carefully calculated um, facade in order to um, in order to protect himself really and to accomplish the specific things he's trying to do when he's writing letters. So to see that kind of openness in his letters to Michelle is something that just really astonished me and it really made me understand her importance. The other um, the other pieces in that vitrine are love letters that Gidebor wrote to her in um, a traditional 18th century um, uh, 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 French style. Um, um, and he did it, of course, with great irony, but the letters are essentially letters where he is fuming about her relationship with another man. Um, they too had an open relationship and Guy Debord had plenty of relationships and brought some of these people into, into his relationships with Michelle. Um, um, but when, when she was having this very serious affair, he, he, he became very jealous and he wrote these, these, these marvelous uh, love poems, which show really a very different side of Yudibor. So uh, uh, that went on probably longer than I thought it would. Um, at this point, I think I'll stop talking and see if uh, I can answer any questions from you, Mike, or anyone else. That's terrific. Uh, I wanted to start, Kevin, uh, with uh, riffing off a title of one of the labels of some other materials you have, which is a river runs through it. And I'm not going to ask you necessarily <laughs> about that now, but but you sort of situated uh, the two sets that you spoke about. And I wondered if you could, for us, situate, uh, forgive the pun, the situation is a little bit more in two ways. One is I know from you and from previous shows and teaching that you do here, a uh, great collection of situationists, both uh, DeBoer and Bernstein, but others. So I wonder if you could describe a little bit the overall collection that you've assembled of situationists, uh, those, uh, but, but some others, and talk a little bit about how they're used in teaching. And I wonder if you could, you know, sort of the resonance down to our current day. One of, one of the things that I've sort of thought about, thanks to the insights you've given, is I may not know uh, the names, and they may not be headline names, but it becomes clear to me that the intellectual influence they've had over time continues to resonate in our own day. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about the overall mm -hmm. collections, and again, what you see as the resonances of the situation as uh, continuing in intellectual life uh, in, in uh, 2023. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um... Yeah, the, the the collections we have um, uh, really a fantastic collection of um, situationists. Um, not Guy Debord. Um, we had I had uh, actually um, uh, contracted with um, uh, his second wife, um, uh, Alice Becker Ho, who also calls herself Alice Debord, um, to to purchase Guy's archive, but um, it was blocked by the French government um, under the administration of um, Sarkozy, which is a, another story in its own right. But never mind that. But so uh, De Boer's archive is not here, um, but we have the archives of many many others who played really an important role in the situationist international, um, most notably Raoul Van Egem, whose book um, on the revolution, the revolution of everyday life, it's translated in English that way, is um, is really for many people. I, ha I can't tell you how many people have told me that book changed my life, really. Um, alongside the Boer's Society, the Spectacle was one of the two books that, that did a lot to shape um, uh, protest culture and, and, and artistic ideas about, about um, resisting um, the oppressive norms of the status quo, um, in particular in 1968 with the uh, uprisings in France, but then after that, just going, um, uh, just really rippling around around the world. Um, but many others too, um, Jacqueline de Jong, um, who uh, was actually the editor of the Situationist Times, amazing woman, um, uh, who I also had the good fortune to, to meet many years ago, um, who has uh, uh, deposited her archives at, at Beinecke um, and was somebody who, like Michelle, had a real voice of her own and um, didn't dare to stand out against the Guy de Boer. And actually, when Guy de Boer uh, and uh, Van Egem and others drove the artists out of the movement in the early 1960s, 
Michelle Bernstein, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, Jacqueline Dion left along with them and used the first issue of the situation as times to attack Guy Debord openly for his, his stance on the arts. Um, so, um, so all of these people are people who for a brief or a longer period of time were part of the situation that's international, but then for one reason or another, almost all of them ended up being expelled or kicked out or forced to for, uh, pressured into leaving on their own. Um, so I tend to call that the situationist diaspora. Um, and it's a group of people who in the early 60s left the movement, most of them, and then went off to other places in Europe where they pioneered new te uh, techniques and new strategies of using art for the purposes of protest and resistance and, and that sort of thing. Uh, all of whom came back um, in 1968 to Paris. Um, alongside the situationists like Guy Debord, who were still in the movement um, then. So uh, I call it the situationist diaspora. Uh, I think it's a good definition. If you're interested in seeing the collections we have, you can go to a, my website, which is just called postwar culture at binicky.org, going under the collections tab, and you'll see um, a lot of the collections there. Um, there's also uh, one, one tab just for situationist and related material where you can get an overview of those collections. And um, in terms of resonance, uh, situationists really kind of were rediscovered or in America in the 1980s, late 80s and early 90s. There was a book by uh, Grail Marcus called Lipstick Traces, which was a uh, um, a underground history of the 20th century where he draws lines between from the Dada movement of Dada through the situationists and into the present that made a big, uh, big splash. Um, but after that, there, there's been a lot of interest and particularly on the part of artists who are involved in uh, art activism and protest, the situationists developed several important techniques that would probably be uh, familiar to most people um, on this call, although the name detournement may not be familiar. Detournement is just the subversive sca scavenging of images and texts from, um, uh, from mass media um, and from uh, mass culture and using those materials in a way, mashing them up in a way that really makes them work against themselves to make them speak a subversive message and not the message. They love to use advertising, for example, in that way. And that's something that has had an enormous influence. But just the whole notion of, uh, of uh, detournement of this, of this kind of what we would call culture jamming, I suppose, today. Um, is something that uh, owes a lot to the situationists um, alongside their notions about urban geography and the way to navigate cities in a way that's subversive, a technique that they call derive, which just means the drift. And so those two concepts are really largely behind the influence of the situationists um, um, uh, in, in a broad sense, but also in, a, in the academy where there have been courses taught on situationists um, uh, out of our collections at Yale. Uh, Craig Buckley in the art history department has, has taught an entire seminar on the situationists based out of our collections. But they've also, they're, they're also used, they're very popular in courses in the architecture school where situationists have had a, a major influence. Um, and uh, art history, um, graphic design, the program certainly uh, people have, are, are very drawn to the situationists and they've been quite influential there so that those are some of the ways that they resonated and uh, kind of a uh, overview of what we have at Bonnie that's great and I think you know I, I was thinking as you were talking folks get a little bit of an insight of why uh, my colleagues and I have the best jobs in the world because we get to hang out with people like you every day and learn every day from you. But the good news is you don't have to be a staff member at Meineke to learn from Kevin Rep and, and his colleagues. Uh, so you can see it in exhibitions like the current one and the one upcoming. And I've posted in the chat the link uh, that Kevin mentioned, post-war culture at Meineke. So lots of materials and resources, links to collection there. I've also posted the brief description uh, of the show that will be coming up in August, and there'll be much more online, and obviously there'll be a lot in the exhibition itself on view uh, August through uh, the beginning of January 2024. So let me turn to a question from an audience member, uh, and I'll, I'll quote the full, it's a comment, uh, set of comments and a question, uh, which I think uh, 
many will co-sign, so magnificent. Thank you for your sharing with us your expertise on the selected material and for your generos generosity in sharing it with us. I also thank you, Kevin, for your willingness to help us researchers at Beinecke through the arduous path through the archives. Uh, the questioner notes, as usual, your brain power is impressive and your ability to collect and curate material is incredible. So the question is uh, not only Michelle Bernstein, the questioner uh, writes, but it seems that all the other members of the Situation International come under De Boer's shadow. And the question is, do you think that research in Beinecke's archives has the real power to change this scenario? Okay, the scenario is that um, basically oh. the boar is the sun yes. who gets all the attention. So, yeah. uh, uh, I absolutely do. And, uh, thank you, Joyce. Um, Joyce is uh, is is somebody who's part of um, a fantastic network that I uh, through the website actually um, um, uh, that that I just mentioned to you that. Uh, there's a young, a fantastic group of young art activists and, and other kinds of activists in Sao Paulo and Brazil who discovered me through the website. And um, it's one of the real pleasures of my job to be able to see the impact of my work um, um, uh, as far away as that by people who are doing amazing, amazing kinds of things. Really, really terrific work. And, and Joyce is one of those people. She's written a number of books. She's written poetry, a book of poetry, and um, is someone who um, really, I think, lives and breathes the uh, kind of uh, resonance of situ the Situationist movement today um, around the world. But um, yes, the uh, Guy Debord tends to, as I say, overshadow things. Michelle Bernstein uh, is certainly um, someone who has fallen under that shadow, but practically everyone else. In fact, the, um, uh, uh, well, maybe I'll leave that story uh, for another time. <laughs> but um, uh, suffice it to say that there has been a definite um, effort Put to to putting Guy front and center and kind of smothering the other voices that may have had a role to play in how the situationists developed their ideas and, and, and put them into practice. But um, I will, um, since I know that Joyce is working on the papers of Mustafa Kayati, I will um, uh, certainly mention Mustafa as somebody who falls into that category. Mustafa Kayati is the author of uh, a very, very famous pamphlet called um, uh, On the Misery of Student Life, is usually how it's translated into English, which was one of the underground texts. It was published by the Situationists um, and then um, and then circulated underground um, in the 60s to become a really important text uh, all over the world, really. Um, we have a Farsi translation of it in the collection, um, uh, but uh, especially in 1968. Um, uh, and and Kayati is somebody who, who left the movement in 1969. He is a Tunisian by birth. Um, and. Uh, was uh, when he was he came to France to study at the University of Strasbourg in um, the early uh, 1960s, mid 1960s, and um, then became involved in situationists. But he left in 1969 to go um, uh, to um, to uh, Lebanon to take part in what he refers to as the as the the uh, the um, Arab Revolution. Um, uh, and to support that revolution. Um, and it was a revolution that really is quite different from the Arab Spring that we all probably would think of in, in, in that context. Um, and uh, I, I've been urging him to finish his book. He's been working on a book on the Arab Revolution for a very long time. But his, his contacts, his relationship with that, with, with the Maghreb um, and North Africa gives a completely different uh, spin on on what the who the situationists were and what the movement was about. Jacqueline de Jong, who I mentioned before, is another powerful character, and even uh, Gianfranco Sanguinetti, who um, who remained in the movement till the very end, is someone who has a powerful powerful voice um, um, and is um, has had a had a continuing influence. He's somebody who also um, is incredibly 
uh, knowledgeable in his own right, and and certainly De Boer found in him somebody who had even uh, greater knowledge of a lot of the Italians, um, Machiavelli, uh, especially that um, that De Boer particularly admired. And there, you can see in their letters, which are you know 10, 12 pages long, just how much that intellectual exchange went for both of them. So yes, I I, I certainly hope that. Uh, uh, research in the collection will give a, a full, more full-bodied view of uh, the situationists and their legacy, um, and also feed in, as I as I said at the beginning of my comment here, um, to uh, you know more activist, um, uh, um, creative and activist um, uh, activations of of the ideas in in those collections. Terrific, and uh, you mentioned uh, Mustafa Kayati and. Uh, Robin Doherty has some of uh, those materials on view in this show as well, which shows the cross collaboration when you bring all these folks together to select a show uh, and also in conversation. Uh, so another reason folks should make a point of coming by to see this current show, Beinecke exhibitions are free and open to all seven days a week and the current show is on view uh, through just uh, the beginning of uh, July. Uh, let's go from France in the 50s and 60s and, and on uh, to Germany in the 30s. And I wonder if you could talk about another item that you selected, uh, the Illustrated German Workers newspaper from the early 30s. And if you could, for mm -hmm. the audience, paint a uh, word picture of that item uh, and talk about its importance. Wow. Yeah. I wish we had an image to show there. I don't suppose you could just go online and pull up a heart field just so people can it's hard to talk about Hartfield without, you know, showing an image. But um, uh, the Eitz at the Arbeiter Illustrated Zeitung was a uh, communist-affiliated newspaper in in Germany that um, was driven into exile when the Nazis took over in 1933 and continued to publish. Really, even you know, the Nazis then, of course, the Germans um, invaded uh, Czechoslovakia. In 1938, and so they had to move again. Um, and um, uh, but it it it, it was a, a newspaper that was written really um, for workers. Um, it's the workers' newspaper. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, can't see what that one is. Okay. Yeah, that's a wonderful image there. Um, it's a great um, Hartfield. So Hartfield, John Hartfield is a uh, an artist who uh, was came out of Berlin Dada movement um, and was one of the real pioneers of photo montage. Um, and um, you can see a wonderful example of that here with the um, fellow with the with the quill pen uh, jabbing it into the frog. Um, he uses frogs in another um, uh, uh, in several of these images and I said um, uh, in, in really funny ways. Um, one of them has a frog in a Nazi uh, uniform boasting about the, you know, the Nazi racial superiority and that sort of thing. Um, he's got a really wicked sense of humor, and um, he combines that with a tremendous artistic talent to create really um, striking, striking images um, that are, in a way, not unlike um, the detournement of the situationists that I talked about earlier. In any case, um, uh, Hartfield is somebody who's part of the historical avant-garde, the high modernist movement. His, his um, photo montages have had a tremendously huge impact, but they are thought of today as works of art. And, and um, you rarely, rarely see them in the context of that they were in, uh, created for, which is the context of um, a workers' newspaper aimed at um, um, uh, really galvanizing anti-fascist um, uh, uh, sentiment and action on the part of the working class. Um, uh, instead, what happens is that usually these 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 fantastic um, uh, photo montages are uh, ripped out and and cut and and then um, framed and they end up on the walls of of um, of a of um, of of wealthy collectors in their apartments. You can imagine them, you know, somewhere um, in the you know Upper East Side on. on you know, somewhere. And that's really you know, what I, you know, by displaying those 
um, in the in the uh, in the original context I wanted to underline and show. It's I also show in that same uh, uh, vitrine I show. Um, Another newspaper that was put out by the same people who published the Arbeiter Illustrated Zeitung, which was called Der Fo uh, Arbeiter Fotograf, the worker photographer. And um, workers, uh, when, uh, when Hartfield started, first they first started publishing Hartfield um, in the inside pages of the of the newspaper in the late 20s and the workers just absolutely loved them and fell uh, in love with them and were really impressed by the fact that you know uh, photography is not necessarily just you know objective truth you know i mean you can you can weaponize photography in really effective ways and um so um, in order to help them do that, um, the the, the um, editors of the Eidset also published um, the Workers' photog Photographer, which has um, detailed tips for workers on how to go out and, uh, and take their own uh, images, and those pictures then would be published in the Workers' Illustrated newspaper alongside the hard fields. So... Um, so yeah, it's um, it's a. It, uh, I actually feature uh, another issue of I set in the exhibition that's coming up this fall, just because of the tremendous impact that it's had. Um, it certainly had a huge impact in the Soviet Union, where the constructivists and the suprematists avant-garde were um, really very important in promoting the early um, Bolshevik regime in the in the Soviet Union until they were kind of fell out of favor and were driven driven um, uh, out, some of them to suicide. But in the early 20s through the kind of early 30s, photo montage in, in the Soviet Union was tremendously, tremendously powerful. And uh, Hartfield was a big influence on them. The one thing that you don't see in the Soviet uh, photo montage that you see in Hartfield is that tremendous sense of humor that I talked about before. That's something that just really doesn't doesn't show up in, in the others so, so i guess that's what, that. what i have to say there and and again it's a resource that that's here uh, other collections have them as well but the, the the collection here is extraordinary and it's great to see it in the exhibition great to know that there'll be more in the fall and encourage people to again explore on their own in the collections as well as online um we have a question, which is almost a, a setup, I think, for you to talk a little bit about your show, but not intended probably, but it, but it, it functions well as a sort of setup to talk about your upcoming show. So the question I ask, is there anything in the collections uh, uh, at Yale by artists uh, around May Day 1970? So mm -hmm. stuff that was done uh, in New Haven. And so uh, maybe you can answer that, but also talk some about the highlights and streams that you'll be bringing together in the show on art protests in the archives. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we uh, Yale has fantastic collections of of, of that um, of May Day. There's a huge collection at Manus well, uh, what formerly called manuscripts and archives, but um, just since last year has been um, has been uh, joined with the Beinecke collections in a in a, a, a broad edition of Beinecke um, has a huge, fantastic collection of May Day, and we also have. Um, uh, a collection, the Catherine Rohrbach collection of Erica Huggins in the um, in in our collections um, uh, in, in Beinecke that um, that has some fantastic artwork showing the trials, um, uh, uh, some very nice uh, artwork from the trials of the of the Panthers, which is um, what the May Day um, 1970 uh, rallies were were largely about focusing attention on those and, and mobilizing um, support for the Panthers and those. But um, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, there are, it, as far as local artists go, um, that's something that I haven't uh, had a chance to explore myself um, too much, other than you know, what I've seen in the Erica Huggins uh, collection. But certainly the Black Panthers um, uh, uh, and the uh, we have a fantastic collection of of um, of uh, Black Panther posters by Emory Douglas, um, who um, you know, which are really quite quite amazing, and uh, will figure into that show that you mentioned, the art protest show, certainly very much. Um, also. Um, 
Amir Baraka, um, uh, Leroy uh, Jones, as he called himself before that, um, is another person who figures very much in the show. Who uh, is is quite interesting to me. But I'm very interested in and uh, the the links between um, the ideas about how art can be used to mobilize people in in a post test manner um, in uh, not only in Europe and in the United States in, in, in the, not only in the 1960s, but really going up to the present. And something that, you know, with the, um, you know, Black Lives Matter movement um, and, uh, um, and also really, you know, with Occupy and all, it, it's just something that is a, very much a part of our uh, time that we live in right now. So those collections, um, for uh, on the American side, I am the curator of modern European books and manuscripts. So um, I'm kind of a, a approaching this from, from the perspective of not being the, the, um, the curator of those collections. But I know that Nancy Kuhl and uh, Melissa Barton have both done fantastic things in terms of bringing together creative expressions around, around um, the Black Panther movement and have been the ones who have really been focusing on bringing in material that Back home. Thanks. Um, and thinking about threads that continue in the current show, uh, there's some materials uh, curated by George Miles, the now uh, uh, former curator of Western Americana, retired. So he has some uh, contemporary indigenous art by Dwayne Wilcox uh, uh, of uh, protests, I think, around uh, Dapple and, and other things. So those yeah. also foreshadow probably uh, some of the, and, and continue the streams that will show up in your show. And in your show, we'll those are beautiful. I don't know if anyone talked about those, the the, the ledger art. Yet. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and talk to um, them. We have George on but, later in the semester, but go ahead. And oh, okay. Well, if George is going to talk about them, it's just, uh, George inspired me so much with those. Uh, it's a ledger art, which is a, uh, a, a particular form of art, art that, um, evolved from the fact that in the 19th century, um, uh, Native Americans had that the one form of paper they really had um, uh, access to were these ledger books. And so they began to use the ledger books to, to, um, uh, to paint the, um, the stories, the chronicles of their history, which they had traditionally done on animal hides um, and on, you know, on the walls of their their, their tents and so forth, um, instead of that, actually doing them on paper and evolved into this, this tradition that had, has been revived by the, um, the, uh, by the, the Lakota um, uh, in the um, protests against the, um, uh, the, um, the pipeline, the, uh, uh, the uh, Dapple pipeline and the um, 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 really quite moving. And, and I, as soon as I saw them, I actually run a, uh, or have run the last few years of uh, a webinar called Art and Protest. You can see um, those episodes also on my, on the website that um, I gave you the link for. Um, um, I said, I have to have these people on the show. And unfortunately theirs, I, um, I didn't get the, the, uh, the, the, the clearance to post that one online, but it was one of my absolute favorite episodes of this, where you have these people who are living on the res, as, you, as they say, um, uh, um, uh, producing this amazing art. And you can see some fantastic pieces of that in the show now, and there will be some again in the show in the fall as well. So that's something to look forward to. Terrific. Um, just a program note again, our next Mondays at Beinecke will be in two weeks on April 3rd. Haruko Nakamura, librarian for Japanese studies, will be leading that conversation. There's a link in the chat and everyone will see in the Beinecke email newsletter. Um, uh, I wanted to close, Kevin, with a sort of open question to you. Uh, your thoughts, you do a lot with exhibitions. Uh, you've done building white exhibitions uh, here. You've got another one coming up. And I wonder if you could just share, and I, I was touched by what you said about our Brazilian colleague and, and the impact and glad to see that impact. But I wonder if you could share a story or two of ways that you've seen public audiences impacted by some of the shows that you've done. And uh, you know, mm -hmm. as, as a curator, you, you hope that 
things will uh, touch people, move people, uh, provoke people. So I wonder if you could just talk uh, some about how you've experienced reactions that people may have had to exhibi exhibitions you've done here in the past. Wow. Yeah, it's, um, uh, let me think about that. That's a, um, you know, just, I mean, in terms of, you know, I suppose I did a show um, in 2009 called, um, it was the very first show I did at, when I started to move into this collecting area, and it was called uh, The Post-War Avant-Garde and the Culture of Protest in Europe, um, 1945 to 1968 and beyond. And that exhibition really, um, uh, uh, it really, um, I guess it really made a big splash in a lot of ways, and it, it, it generated a lot of interest. Um, I think I spoke about it at the um, the local NPR station asked me to come on and speak about it, and um, and um, it, it it aroused a lot of different reactions from people. I mean, uh, um, some of them. It's 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 interesting even today that uh, that this this kind of material, even though the 1960s are long over, can still be provocative. So I would just say that it's it's material that has the capacity to shake people up in all sorts of ways. That people who are not necessarily expecting to find that sort of thing when they come to a rare book library. Um, I, I guess that's being a bit evasive, but um, maybe it gives you some idea. The the the, uh, the most recent full building show I did was um, on experimental poetry, which um, uh, seems like kind of a maybe a, a less accessible topic. But in fact, the show was so full of um, really, um, you know, visually striking material that had also much of it really quite a lot of subversive messaging going on in that. Um, that that one also was one that I had a lot of people just really um, um, from from various backgrounds who were not at Yale um, uh, uh, um, uh, really expressing you know um, a lot of inspiration from from it and really saying you know this is something that I've learned so so much from and I, you know I, I'm eager to actually put this kind of thing into practice which is something that I really love to hear. Um, uh, you know, uh, other chances I've had to really, uh, to, to bring, I've worked some with the Institute, uh, uh, Institute Library here in, uh, in town and been, been able to kind of, um, reach out to audiences there with this material. Um, and, uh, um, I'm looking for, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to see a lot of resonance, um, in the art protest show in particular, you and me both, Mike, are, are hoping to do a lot of outreach that will bring and activate those collections on the part of high school students and, uh, and but others and hopefully you know, people at, uh, at uh, local artists can become involved. I've been trying to get local artists on the uh, art protest um, for the last two and a half years and haven't really succeeded. So if there are any of them on this call, I would, I would like to, um, I'd like to encourage them to be in touch with me. Terrific, and I can I can say that you know the shows you've done. Uh, I think about Fun on the Titanic, uh, a show about underground East German protest and and uh, art. Uh, uh, you know, I think about all the time the Beyond Words that you talked about, the teaching that you and your colleagues uh, uh, throughout Yale do. We have coming up in June in New Haven the meeting of Daka Momo the international group that's about preservation of modernist architecture and a lot of the collections that you showcase uh, sort of inform me and we'll probably look to pull out some of the Bauhaus and other materials that you oftentimes uh, showcase in teaching with colleagues in the School of Architecture. Uh, and I think it really, you know, it's, as today's conversation, your generosity in uh, sharing your time and, and uh, helping guide people as our colleague from Brazil mentioned into these collections is a taste and, and hopefully everybody who can will come to see the current show and again the show that will be upcoming on art protests in the archives and it really embodies 
I think this place, we do not seek, we're not an entertainment uh, place. We're not here to give you stuff and, and to give you the answers. Hopefully there are answers here, but more it's to provide the material so that you can engage things. Uh, you, the audience, can be participants and active learners and find out things and put things together and, and uh, chart your own streams through the collections. And Kevin, you do such a great job in the uh, uh, webinars that you do and the exhibition that you do, in this case, in selecting materials as part of a group exhibition that gives people access points so that they themselves can learn more.